Thank you, guys. All right, so yes, um, we'll see how, how about like that I do all those things really well. You're gonna have to tell me in the evaluation survey that you're gonna receive that I'm gonna write. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, uh, yes, I, I've, uh, my main sort of career over the last couple of years have been consulting on different issues related to data-driven change, right? Be that the back-end project evaluation, be that organization assessment before some changes are made, organizational readiness. So my background is in organization development and statistics and research. Um, my gazillion degrees, being a Russian, I had to have a few. Um, and yes, I'm also a professional musician, so it's a couple of things I'm doing at the same time. Um, and actually, speaking of meeting people, I've worked with ROI for the last, um, I guess, three some, three, four years, and I have not really met these guys in person, which is an amazing way, right, that we work today. So I've worked with them and also with Yoni Gordis, and they're in Vancouver virtually. Uh, they you know, have been a fantastic client. And then uh, the first time that I have met um, uh, Justin was actually when I was performing at a show. And so <laughs> you kind of got to see my rock star personality first, <laughs> which was <laughs> both awkward but also amazing. And I think uh, also came as a result of ROI Connect and Create because I was performing as part of the set of an ROI participant who reached out to me knowing that I'm involved with ROI and basically said, you want to do a show. So um, I think it's amazing and amazing experience to be here with you. So just uh, very quickly, I wanted to get to know you a little bit. So if you can just, it's old traditional way, just go around the room, just quickly tell me who you are, who you work for, and if you've ever experienced evaluation as a participant or maybe you have done evaluation, be that You've gone around the room and asked people how they are doing, you know, in relates to your pro uh, relation to your project or in any other way. But yes, you, yeah, you, not? you're starting. You're a participant. So my name is Sam Koenig. I'm um, I'm a director at the Hillel in the Netherlands called Health University, and uh, it's my sixth year being a Hillel professional, and I have definitely seen uh, evolvement in terms of how uh, whether it's being pressured or how important it is to create. Uh, formulas uh, and surveys for evaluating mm -hmm. um, the work we do and also the impact, uh, not necessarily the program itself because we're moving away in terms of creating programs, mm -hmm. but like what impact... Longer we, term. Yes, what impact are we having on, 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 on the students? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. My name is Barr. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, working in Nelson and mm -hmm. doctorate research. I ran okay. the doctorate research for years in why are you here? You know everything. I'm here because <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm working for the bad guys on my day job. Okay. Um, but I also um, I also run a, a micro fundraising startup using okay. a couple of technology to collect a lot of money from investors. Okay. And I'm very interested in how data is being used is put into usage in the social world and how can we utilize Got what it. we know and the model that we use okay. to do like better things and Great. Uh, position how to use this better. Right. Okay, and you know evaluation is like a kind of market research turned sideways, so you're gonna be helping me out. Okay, <laughs> thank you, go ahead. Consultant 
Um, but I think that what will be helpful to me also is that I work part time at the Federation in Los Angeles oh, okay. with a small program about next gen and engagement, mm -hmm. and it's a grant sustained program. Okay. And so as part of my grant report, my grant report, I have to submit information about evaluation and impact and so on. Okay. Those three Great. Points. Great. Thank you. I'm Shauna. Um, I won't tell you about the fun, the interesting personal side because I came from my professional growth. I work for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee or JDC. Uh -huh. whatever. Um, specifically, I'm going to be returning in August to our young professional engagement department, JDC and Twine. And all of our programs require evaluation right. and also metrics to prove that they work. Right. <laughs> um, like, I'm specifically going to be going into a role of long-term service, mm -hmm. evaluating our long-term service programs, which okay. are at least a year. Um, but in the past, I've been a part of many programs that have required evaluation and also led many of our trips, which are more short-term, and right. all of them require evaluation as well. Got it. So. OK. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. So, I'm from Mexico, and mm -hmm. I work for a foundation that supports and sponsors Jewish culture projects and organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's a very well-known foundation in the Mexican community, but it is also very small. It is a family foundation. Mm -hmm. So the way we work is very organic, and we don't really have like a lot of structure uh, or established uh -huh. processes. So I'm very interested in okay. uh, like looking at from the other side. Right. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been involved in the Archimedes mm -hmm. School that was mm -hmm. the Mercedes School of uh, very much frustrated with the way it works. So I do that a lot the technology that allows uh, nonprofits to collaborate and huh. cooperate and then you come up with resources and share best practices mm -hmm. to be more efficient uh, and actually be able to benchmark their right. operations. Right. And we look into quality that you can quantitate the two mm -hmm. uh, parameters. Right. One of the challenges that we're defining right now is determining what are the right processes to evaluate right. the impact of this program. Right. So we looked at the IRA systems, we looked at the way I can make fun, raise their program. Mm -hmm. So how we can write these things and what's your approach. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you guys. So it's kind of lucky we have such a small group here so we can really and I mean in any event I'm trying to you know when I run my programs kind of be responsive so if um, um, you know I see varying degrees of experience with evaluation if I'm going too slow or too fast or I may be drawing on you for examples you know kind of giving your experience in the room uh, it's really for you right um, this materials is probably more than we can even cover in this time, uh, especially given the two minute delay with technology. <laughs> so um, don't sort of like even look at it, <laughs> take it with you. It's the same thing that's on the screen, right? I mean, freely obviously take notes, but um, it's, there's some kind of more specific tools and examples for you to take home further and my contact information is on there as well if there are further questions that we don't have a chance to discuss here. But I wanted to begin with a little story of you know, uh, my experience in evaluation, um, more from the corporate world, but again, it's the same idea, same tools. I was in a doctoral degree program and I was an intern, and um, I was um, in a human resources department and we were running or we're going to run a big survey because we really had a problem in this organization which was an accounting firm, very old-fashioned accounting firm, um, you know, people in suits and everything. And they had a huge problem. People were leaving in packs and in particular uh, experienced people. So, you know, it's expected that the younger folks that come in in those kind of environments are kind of like, you know, used as slaves to like make copies and stay until 4 a.m. in the morning, um, get their experience and then kind of churn quickly, two, three years, but their people were turning like in one year, they were gone. 
But more experienced people, it's a real problem because it takes a lot of money to bring them on board. Like, and then they come in and they don't even have time to become effective. And they were leaving within six months, okay? So this organization wanted to understand what's happening, okay? Um, there was, has never been a survey in this organization that actually asked people, what's up, what's going on? Let's evaluate your experience and let's try to tie it to the actual issue we're having and try to find the causes of it. So here I was, you know, in my doctoral degree program, kind of like barely knowing or understanding what I was doing. And I was sort of put in charge of this process because I was in a doctoral degree program. So supposedly I knew how to do research, right? So we interviewed a bunch of vendors for them to give us like a standard kind of like employee satisfaction evaluation type survey. Nothing was good enough. Like we were gonna create the survey, right? Like something custom, something very specific for our organization. Hours upon hours, you know, of conversations, brainstorming. So we created this huge long survey, you know, Nothing was standard, nothing like came from previous research. So understandably, when we got the data back, okay, some questions were not, we realized later, like really phrased really well. There were a lot of missing data because people may not have understood something or something may have not been like a comfortable question to answer. There's also in statistics, you know, sometimes you're trying to, um, you know, just check how your survey is by looking at items. Do they like hang together? People who answered in a certain way one question in theory should be answering similar, a different question. Like nothing really worked the way it was supposed to be. Um, big bummer, we were all sitting in the room and the boss, my boss, this guy with a lot of years of experience just sits there and says, Svetlana, but it doesn't matter. And I'm like this, you know, PhD student, you know, everything by the book, I'm so bummed and I'm saying, we have created this survey, like we worked so hard and nothing is this theoretically beautiful and he keeps saying, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And then the light bulb goes in my head because we look at the difference between what senior managers were thinking, the, um, so the, the, like the senior management, then there's this experienced employees, right? And then there's this, um, you know, like entry level employees. I can't write, right? So, you know, the survey had the scale of one through five, do you agree or disagree with things like, you know, there's good work balance here, I enjoy working here, uh, you know, the, the work we do is excellent, so what's your guess in terms of like the levels of how happy with everything, you know, or not happy with everything different groups were? Like just give me a guess. So you saying like this, 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 yeah? Wrong. Like this, like this, and like this, right? Because remember what I told you? This experienced people, the most expensive people, hated the place. And so basically, we showed this guys, the senior guys, this chart, and they just were floored. Because first of all, they didn't realize that the gap here is so huge, right? Second of all, they kind of didn't care about this guy so much. They were like, you know, I mean, we're making money here. They cost nothing. It costs nothing to bring them. They're replaceable. So yes, they don't like working until 4 a.m. and being yelled at, you know? Yes, it's worse than in the industry, but still. But this stunned them. These are the people that brought them business. These are the people who were supposed to um, really drive the business of an organization. And that suddenly explained everything to them. And that's why my manager, the boss, said, Svetlana, it doesn't really matter. 
like, okay, your questions were not perfect, okay, there was some missing information. This is the data that's going to drive change in your organization. This one summary slide, like I had 100 other slides behind it in case they wanted to know. This one slide just floored these people who never were even interested. Organizational culture? Satisfaction of whom? <laughs> like, it was a super conservative place. So I wanted to give this introduction to you to kind of make two points. When we do research and evaluation in organizations, this is what we care about. It's all about data that's driving change. It's about practicality and pragmatism of it, right? We're not doing, I mean, we are. I have a doctoral degree, right? But we are doing social research. So we want to be rigorous. We want to be as good as we can in, in terms of what it is that we do, how we put together surveys, et cetera. But this is what we need to keep in mind. Why we're doing it and how will this help us drive whatever change we want. So to give you an example, I've been evaluating ROI. Now it's in my fourth year. Um, it's all about, it's, it's an organization that wants to look at itself every year after the summit. I, I'm not evaluating the organization, I'm evaluating the summit, right? And want to say, what are our key goals here? And how can we make this experience better? Will I be able to publish findings from those surveys in the you know, Journal of Organization Behavior? No, the survey is not scientific, but that's why I'm doing this, right? Okay? So that's, you, would you really, that's an important um, thing that you have to keep in mind. So therefore, the kind of rigor that you apply to doing this research, you want to have it more than just sort of kind of very casual, you know, I just go around the room, which is, by the way, what I've been doing, one of the great advantages of being here. Like, I've been going around and, like, talking to people and asking them, like, how's it going for you? Because I want to kind of, that's one of the reasons they brought me here. Like, I wanted to get, like, first impressions, right? But I can't really, like, that's too biased, okay? Like, we're drinking, you know, champagne, or we're, like, every, at 3 a.m., you know, like, eating, eating nuts. Eating nuts. <laughs> Those were good almonds. Ugh. Oh my God. Ugh. Okay, yeah. Anyway, back. Right, so that's like a very casual research, right? And then there's like research, you know, the book like research. How do you like my drawing? Ugh. Right, that you publish. Like, you want to be here, you want to be somewhere in between, right? So you want to aim for rigor, but really keep the in mind that you're doing this to drive change, right? Okay? So, with that in mind, I'm gonna tell you more about this. Right, so you kinda know how to do this, and then you can, you can lower the bar. And you can stay pragmatic and practical, right, to what it is that you are trying to achieve. Okay, so, the program evaluation, why, what, and how. Okay. You guys have any comments, questions before we proceed? Yes, I'm about to go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, any any comments? Anything? No. You're floored by my story, and you're like, "Thank God I don't work for accounting firm." Yes. You may be getting to it later, so feel free to talk. Getting to it later. Okay, I'm getting to it later. Thank you. <laughs> okay. No, no, but I was wondering if you could comment. Um, I do, from your experience about, obviously not our ROI because we don't do this, but um, you're awesome. about uh, perhaps other clients you had that um, initiated a process of serving an evaluation, and that, but the corporate culture is resistant to change and probably will not implement any of those things. Right. This is in the domain of organization development and a little bit outside of this. So that said, one of the reasons you want to know this is to say, 
This is not me telling you this. This is the data. She knows. I have, and this is one of the reasons they, you guys, bring an external evaluator, right? It's amazing. I was just telling someone the other day, again, from a corporate world example, you know, which I equally work in both. I was doing training evaluation for a large company that implements, uh, rather, I'm sorry, builds and sells uh, medical equipment. You know, like stitchers for surgeries, you know, little clippers, whatever. I learned more about different way to do sutures than I ever wanted. These are like mostly big, like Midwestern American men in their like 40s and 50s. Top guys who sell to doctors, take them out for golf, you know, this is how they used to sell, right? Big changes in the US healthcare. Now these guys have to sell to hospitals. So just a different interaction. So the company wanted to train them in selling to, in hospitals versus to doctors. The first step, focus groups. I've had a bunch of focus groups all around the US sitting with people in the room, asking them you know, what's working, what's not working for training, what are the skills you're lacking, blah, blah. So okay, I'm asking this man, right, who's done this for 20 years, and some like really high-powered woman, um, what skills like you're lacking, okay, basically, right? So in one focus group, there was their supervisor sitting, because she wanted to facilitate this. And again, like, who would think that this tough guys would be afraid of a supervisor, like, and I got a lot of good information and feedback. And then at some point, like, you know, I told the supervisor, you know, why don't we step out? Like, let's see. And the room exploded in a completely different way. And it just, I know that that's how you're supposed to, like, you never put a supervisor with the people that they supervise in the focus group. But to see it in real life, it's like I had goosebumps. This guys were suddenly much more sincere about the skills they're lacking, you know, <laughs> and what it is they need from training. So again, this is the reason they bring in external people, external evaluators, and you, you tell them that's one of your strongest tools. So be resistant, but this is why you're losing a ton of money. Continue on, right? But that's like a cop out answer to your question that's keeping me in line with my, you know, topic, but resistance to change is a huge subject, right, inside the uh, organization development world. How could you talk to you about applying? Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about the whys, why we evaluate the programs, the what's, which is like a big, big topics in evaluation. Then we're going to, like, like in a funnel, keep going more specific, some selected techniques. And then, um, if we have time, hopefully we will, we'll just talk about some of your projects and evaluation for those, yeah? Okay, so why do we conduct program evaluation? That's an actual question. <laughs> why? Why are you doing this? Why are we doing Why are you here? Why do you want to know why conduct pro project evaluation? What's driving you? Why do you want to do evaluation? To assess program impact. To like actually know yeah. if it's working or not. Okay. To maximize the effect. Right. To get. So that ROI. Yes, I was going to say that, but thank you for saying that. To determine which properties work better than others. Right. What can also also change the program or its geographic location. Right. Can I, get, can I challenge you guys with something? So, okay, there are two answers here. Both are right. Um, some person, one person saying if it works or not, and another person saying what works better. What's the difference here? So you guys both said, like, basically, I evaluate the projects because I want to know if it worked or not. Like, kind of more definitive answer, and another person is saying, I want to know what works better, what works less, you know, if, uh, effectively, et cetera. That's more nuanced kind of 
perspective. It's not just a, did it work? Yes, right. then we do it again. If not, no, we don't do it again. It's correct. It's, it looks at all the different components of the program and tries to identify which parts are reaching right. in what way. Right. And then those parts can be applied to everything. Right, exactly. And so what we're seeing in evaluation is just a side comment that there's much more of this now because it's less zero-sum approach, like it either worked or not. And as evaluator, I actually use, again, sort of talking about effective way to conduct evaluations, I use this when I talk to people because, to give you an example, I had a client where uh, they engaged much like this, like a production company to help out with like kind of logistical aspects of what they were doing and very happy with it but just wanted to see this. Like what worked, what worked not so well, how can we improve working together so next time it's even better. So they've asked me to do this as part of a larger relation. So imagine this, I go to this vendor and it's an important client for them, right? And I say, well, you know, I'm here to like evaluate how it worked. Imagine if I came in with, I'm here to see if it worked or not, because that implies what? If you didn't work, then you're out, as opposed to, listen, like your client is very happy, but they just want to know like how to make it even better. So from your perspective, tell me, what were some of the things that as a vendor, like you wish your client actually did better, right? It was, I couldn't get them off the phone, <laughs> you know, like they kept talking and they gave so many great ideas. So there's much more of a, this kind of approach, you know, even though like ultimately we want to know, like is it good or bad, but a lot of times we aim for finding that out what worked, what didn't work. Right. What else? Like, okay. So like that's a like a, a, a humane part of why we do evaluation. What? Why else do we do evaluation? Right. Like, let's now get from the skies. Funders want to know. So I've conducted a bunch of evaluations that were sponsored by funders. Funders bring on evaluator often as an external party to say. You know, what's up? We gave some cash. <laughs> how, how did you do? Again, as a evaluator, it's a challenging position to be in. But again, if you come in a little bit more with this perspective, like I'm not here to like, I have no agenda as a evaluator to prove anything. My job is to get to the data. And funder wants to see what worked well and what didn't work well from your perspective. So, like that's also kind of opens the, the doors a little bit. Any other thoughts? Ah, that's cool. Yeah, you're right. I, it's not even on the thing, but you're right. It's like, kind of like with this example that I gave you, right? People in that organization have never been asked, what do you think about this? Or, you know, of, of working here. And we say in organization development that, in, uh, that assessment is an intervention in itself for this exact reason. Because it gives people a sense of importance and engagement, like they're asked. And actually, as part of many evaluations of organizations, I'm not just looking at impact, I'm also looking at the process inside the organization and talking to staff and that you know that gives people sense that you know they're part of it and they that's something I say in the interview this is your chance to voice to be part of improving this process right so that that's important and I'm kind of like jumping into the three of like hows right but that that becomes very important okay so yeah external reasons internal long term okay so you have funding, we talked about that. We're shifting from did it work to how can we make it better, that kind of. And also, as we, so for example, I'm looking at many different 
Okay, I am uh, from Russia originally, right? And I'm a Russian-speaking Jew. There's a ton of programs now in the US that target Russian-speaking Jewish population uh, because it's, it's pretty successful and highly unengaged group. So there is, you know, how can we bring these people home, kind of, and participate in fundraising efforts and philanthropy and, you know, Jewish education, et cetera. So I've evaluated a lot of those small programs, but I've accumulated knowledge base around this group and what things work and what things don't work and why. And so similarly, in social entrepreneurial arena, I have now evaluated a bunch of programs. And there is this, um, you know, for example, the finding that keeps coming up is what, okay, there's an amazing program and then what's next? Like lack of ability to keep engaged after a conference like this is a real barrier in the sector. So kind of people kind of like go back to their thing and there's not a community which allows people in a real way, not like let's meet up online and hang out, but like having a real joint project to do something. So RI is amazing in this, you know, they have this connectors program, they have next steps after this. So you accumulate knowledge among, you know, uh, having done work in a similar area, right? So that's another reason to do evaluation. Anyone has comments on that last part from your world? Yes, it's the sharing of best practices. As well. Uh huh. Right. Right. That's a bit challenging now to generalize when we're talking about the social world because when we're moving in a corporate world from PwC to Casper, any of that, it's, it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same purposes. It's it's profit driven, and we can uh, we can use what we've learned there to accumulate knowledge. But when you talk about this social initiative and this social initiative, it's kind of hard to create. Like we know this is work. Mm -hmm. This is what they say. Let's go further because. Yes, yes, I would like for you guys to respond to each other. Yes. For example, um, there have been a lot of reports on the effectiveness of birth rate as well next, for example, and like right. within those reports, it talks about like what Jewish young professionals are looking for after their experience, how they want to be involved, like what paths to connecting to each other they need. And so by those evaluations, something like my organization, JDC, entwined the department within JDC. That's we can take from what those young professionals wanted post their birth rate experience. And also, like, Next is really great and open about um, moving people to other opportunities. And so, like, from that data, we really gained. Right. OK. And actually, you know what I just did? So when I'm going to kind of jump back and forth a little bit. Well, you know, like in a focus group, there are different techniques, right, of engaging people. And a question would come up. My goal in a focus group, right, is to not give you any of my views. It's to get your views. And a lot of times, what you would do is bounce a question to another person. And that's a technique that's great and I use all the time. Sometimes you can put it back on a person. And you can say, what, what do you think? And it turns out that the person asked a question like as a way of thinking about something and they actually have a pretty good answer. Or sometimes you turn it on others and say, does anyone want to respond to that? Um, and in focus group environments particularly, like it's a great educational method, but the focus group environment is great because again, never ever do you want to express your view because you're not an expert. In that situation, you are a data collector, like as neutral as possible. So, okay. So, key issues in planning evaluation. Basically, blah blah blah. This is like a textbook definition. What is evaluation? Basically, well, don't look. What is evaluation? What What are we trying to do in evaluation? We have this this thing we're doing to someone, like we're bringing them across the world to ROI. And in evaluation, what it is that we're trying to do? 
feedback. Assess if it was worth it. Worth it. More and more work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all on the right track. Impact. Impact. Or you know what? I have even a bit better drawing. There's this like black box, right? You put something like a person in the box. And you look impact, what happened to them, right? See more? Give me like a real nice. Uh, yeah, yes. That's that's how I pay my rent. You're right. <laughs> I'm the other perspective, but yeah, we're you're all right, right? There's there's something that goes in. Then there's this intervention, you know, X, and we want to see, like, what happened? Maybe someone grew hair, okay? So basically, that's what evaluation is about. What would these people be like if they didn't do this? Or what, would this, what, what did these people turn into having done this, right? What, impact, result, like that's kind of like what evaluation is all about, right? So by the way, I'll actually talk to you about later, who heard this term theory of change, right? Theory of change is what? Tell a couple of people who are not in the room, who are not in the room. What's, that's what 3M almonds do to you. <laughs> so what is theory of change? This is your theory of change. This is the box. This is the theory of change of this little guy to this little guy. That's the change, right? And this, the theory is how. By going through this black box, this person turns into this in ROI terms. By going to an ROI conference, the theory of change that ROI has is that an isolated, uninspired entrepreneur will turn into inspired, excited, energized entrepreneur, social entrepreneur. Do you get this example? Do you understand? We also call it logic model. The scary, same exact thing. The logic being, if this individual goes through the black box, if they go here, then, ta-da, they turn into this. If they go to, where are your name tags, Elisa? If Elisa goes to ROI, ROI is the theory of how she changes from hardworking, frustrated, into happy, inspired, Elisa, knowledgeable, she has the skills, etc. Am I belaboring the clear point? Yes. But I think a lot of times, again, which is like I'm kind of like shooting myself in the foot, you know, like, People saying that our evaluation is such an expertise and there's this big word, logic model, theory of change. It's all of this. This is what it is, right? Okay. It's a true example, right? It's not, I mean, the sad part, I know it's. No, it's a little over exaggerated, but go ahead. But do you have to define what it was before? Right. So we'll talk a little bit about that. That's more to the method of evaluation, right? And how can you prove something? And it frankly has to do with the budget. Ideally, you know, there are all sorts of designs that you can implement. So you can observe something before, then there's an intervention, then you can observe something after. So you ask a 
Elisa, how happy are you? Then they go through ROI, then you ask her again in the same exact way, how happy are you? Elisa, you don't mind, we're picking on you. <laughs> okay, and you see the change, right? And you can say, Elisa gotten from unhappy to happy, must be ROI. Ah! There's a little bit of a problem. What's the problem? Maybe Elisa got married in here. <laughs> Maybe Elisa, you know, had really great treatment on a flight and got a, upgraded to first class on the way back home. That's why she's happy. <laughs> Maybe Elisa is sitting at home drinking wine while completing the serving. That's making her happy, right? So what can we do to battle that? Because I mean, ultimately, guys, what you we are having in this, uh, what my research design for evaluation ROI is, is this. I'm just going to ask you after the conference how did it go. So that's like the worst design ever. Better, that's back to this, like book versus like just asking around. That's better than just asking around. It's not going to be published anywhere, but you know. But yeah, so, so what can we do that's better than ask Elisa before, go have her go through intervention and then ask later? What can we do better than that? Oh, sure, we can measure some external factors. So we can ask people, have you been consuming alcohol while completing the survey? Have you been married? Have you been upgraded to first class? And about 500 other questions. So, I mean, idea is great. There are those control variables we can come up with that we think likely may impact the outcome. That's why, by the way, we ask demographic questions in the end of every survey, because these are like our presumed factors. So, in the end of ROI survey, I will look at things like, are people with more experience happier with their summit experience or not? Maybe it gives more to people who have less experience. Maybe it gives more to the people who are like averagely, I don't know, male, female, uh, country of origin, region. So like other things. So that's a great idea. Again, you know, there could be a thousand other things, but we try the best. What else can we do? Timing. Timing, meaning? Meaning do it as uh, fast. As fast or? Oh. Or it could also be later. Okay, that's another great idea. So that, you know, so that the first class upgrade or any immediate, let's say, right. um, other positive or negative right. wouldn't have necessarily a... The uh, impact. Let's say a week later, or it could also be that you do a part one and part two. Right. Um, Can you please talk to Len Schusselman about that? Because I'd like to do that as well in six months. <laughs> no, but you're right. I mean, again, in our world, it's funding question, but absolutely, that... We could in six months, because frankly, after people come back from an experience like this, like we've just been put up in a great hotel, like I personally just went with some you know, group of amazing people yesterday, we walked around Jerusalem last night, the light show, like I'm so happy right now, like I think ROI summit was awesome, right? So you, you had those almonds? Almonds, man. Right, so it wears out a little bit, so the true impact stays, but also ROI, for example, again, is about longer term impact. Like, what, what do you actually do with it? And frankly, in a short term, we can measure your emotional response, we can measure your knowledge, like, around certain aspects like evaluation, but we can't really measure, like, real behavioral changes. So we wanna do that later. What's the problem? Ha. Uh, What's the problem? You say the same thing you said before, but stronger. <laughs> What's the problem here? Six months have passed. Oh my God, there could be thousand things that impacted Elisa here. So on one hand... What about two evaluations? No, part one, I mean, I just did a program and we did, we're basically doing two evaluations. Mm -hmm. We're doing one, um, we're, asking, we're doing one, uh, like an overall, like a more macro one, okay. part one, and then uh, it's not going to take long, and then two, three weeks later, we're going to do one more detailed uh, 
It's fine, but it's the same thing. Same problem? Same problem. Yeah, but, and guess what? We are talking about doing that in six months and seeing like, what people think, but there are like, a ton of issues with this as well. And again, this is the reality, and this is how we do evaluations in the nonprofit world because, again, it's a matter of funding. We can't just like, have a lot of things that, for example, in science we would do, or like in government, which every project would have a 10% budget dedicated to just evaluation. So what can we, like in theory, what else can we do to make this design stronger? Mm -hmm. We'll just be... Yeah, money is no object. No, so the other question is, if we, depends on, in this case, right, this is not a one-off program, we're creating a community, right? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, in this case, implementing some sort of a tracking uh, mechanism. Same thing. Thing. Well, same thing, you know, okay, so we ask people not once, but 20 times. Yeah, but aren't our goals, um, like the organization goals sometimes are being defined not by self, you know, what I feel and what I think about it, but who I am six months later. And then, sure. for example, if I'm activated in like social networks, that's something that can be measured. Yeah, okay, so yeah, there are like more objective indicators of behavior, and that is great, and then there are, but there we're asking, some of the goals of ROI have to do with your empowerment and, you know, ROI is all about investing in an individual, right? So, it's like, how, how um, strong do you feel as a leader, how connected you are? There are some objective indicators of that and some are going to be self-reported. So, the, the biases we're talking about are about self-reported. But, come on, you work in market research, what can we do to improve this design? Are these are pure objectives there? Pure objective? Oh, pure. Clear objective. Again, that's all very important, and we'll talk about that. It has to do with, like, what we actually measure here. So we'll, we'll, let's table this for a second. That's very important, and we'll talk about this. But yeah, how can we improve this? What can we do, like, significantly different from this? Yes, even better. <gasps> Ah, what if Elisa, you're from Argentina. Oh, I thought it's already in the model. Uh, uh, you're pointing uh, on it. There's a friend of Elisa who lives in her same community, right? Does not go to ROI. Deep, 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 deep. Let's see what they're like, having not gone to ROI. Now, maybe in six months, or maybe like you're suggesting some periodic kind of like pulse assessments. It's called a control group. Heard of that? Is it a, has some ethics issues? No! I mean, if we're selecting... It's basic prevention. It's no, basic, yeah, course, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what you're asking is this. There's like, I remember being pregnant with my second daughter and teaching a class in my, you know, in a university which I teach about evaluation and there's a lecture on ethics and like I broke into tears, which I attribute to like being hormonal. <laughs> but it was all about ethics of control groups and you know, studies that were done in the US of like uh, infecting people with disease to see the impact, right? That was mine. And like I like actually started crying like in front of graduate students and I was like, okay, I need a moment. Uh, luckily it was the last lecture, so like they thought that I was a weirdo just for one lecture. But yeah, control group, that helps. How do we know that this person though is similar to Elisa? How do we know that it's a comparable control group? We make sure it is. <laughs> or, so like we make sure we pick someone from her sector, similar demographic, mix as here in ROI, right? So we, we call it a comparable control group, or we do what? That like never happens in nonprofits, but what can we do? Right? Better, you can do better. Starts with R. Randomization, randomization, random assignment. So we can take like 
all people from her organization, that would be really unethical. Give everyone a little card. One says ROI, one says I'm sorry. <laughs> and so people are like randomly assigned who goes to ROI and who is not. So there's no bias. Because what could happen? Maybe the most motivated, the most successful, the most creative people went to ROI. And people who are similar to Elisa stayed behind. So even our control group are like not really comparable, like in, inside of who these people are. So when we measure, it's not gonna be just the impact of the fact that they didn't go to ROI, but it's gonna be like, they're just like a different set of people. They're not as high caliber of leaders. So, you see how tricky that could be? <laughs> Any questions, concerns? And we kind of like really went on a tangent, but you took me there. Wait, so are you saying that it's not, I don't ever see this as like realistically plausible. It's done. So do you do this for Yeah, a no. Okay. Not for all right. We have done last year, we have done the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's being recorded, yeah. so I can't be completely, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's the great thing about it, I can be completely honest. Mm -hmm. Last year we have done this, we have asked people an application, things about the goals that we're trying to evaluate. Yeah. They have gone through intervention, we have asked them later. I'm talking more about the Control, not for a while, yeah. but absolutely I've done that. In non-profit? Yeah, like, yes. Could you give examples of that? Because I can Gosh. see it's really effective. Like, I see the benefits of that. I'm just not sure. Okay, right now, happens. I am doing a project yeah. where people in a, like a non-profit public sector selected for coaching program. Coaching, meaning they get individual coaching from like a coach person. I guess I said it four times already, <laughs> right? To work on their growth inside the organization and like personal development, right? So the control group we're using are, is the wait list. So because like 300 people applied, but they could only take 65 people, okay? So that's the design I'm using. It does not use randomization, okay? But otherwise, this is the design we're using. We're Do doing. They fill things out while they're on the waitlist. Oh gosh, they fill things out better because they want to be in the program next time. Okay. Right. Again, but there's a little bit of a bias here because people who have been selected are better, <laughs> high caliber, more priority for whatever reason that their managers, after everyone applied, picked them. But otherwise, they're comparable, and we're going to have to see what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that you can see the effects that are why kind of you. So how am I different? Let's say you're in school. Mm -hmm. How am I different now this year in school than last year because I went to our why? Okay. How, what skills do I have? How does okay. they change? And maybe those are those are issues that you don't identify. Right. Okay. But coming from the program. I got now, you. Person. That's, right. That's, that's really the probably real lasting impact. Right. Well, you know, one would hope, first of all, so how we come up with what we actually evaluate. I wonder, do I have it in here? Um, that has to do with the logic model. So again, you're asking, it's amazing. You're asking the same question, but like in different ways. <laughs> you're just a very persistent person. Would you stop already? Uh, you basically keep asking question of what's in this observation. Like what is, are the aspects that we're evaluating? And again, this is how you do it. There's an expert group that consists of the program stakeholders, like leadership of ROI in this case, 
of evaluator, of some external individuals, and then also people here, like what I'm doing here, I'm going around and like sitting down with people and telling them who I am and asking them like what kind of things you, you're feeling now, like what, how's it going for you, how you feel this experience impacting you. And I've done that before also with people over the phone. So with all this, we come up with a model of what we think are the purported like plausible impacts, okay? And then we also leave open-ended questions. So with that, we cover some portion. We'll never ever cover everything, but we cover most of what the impacts would be, okay? So can there be like a right letter home type thing where we ask people, like report back what's happening? I think programs like ROI are kind of have that through blogging and social sort of media where people keep in touch and say that. And I, I know they monitor it and I read some of it as well before putting together surveys. Again, social science is imperfect. You know, there's a, we have this difference we talk about and research between, between a construct like love, right? What is love? Tell me. Oh, come on. It's not like we're in fifth grade. You can say something. Like, what is love? Unmanageable emotion. Unmanageable emotion, okay. Something. Affection, okay. Right. Right. Come on, you can do it. Connection, right? So link, connection. Uh, I forgot everything out. Unmanageable emotion. Partnership, Partnership right? Unity. Is there, oh, unity, right? So all of this become variables we measure to represent this construct. And we say that it's always partial. Ugh. It's never, ever fully representing. So it's kind of like this. Right? It's never like that thing. And then what do we do with that? We dumb it down even further. Oh! Right? We, we like create a survey, right? Click in the boxes. Right? So that's like the measurement part. So there's a construct, there's a variable. And then there's a measure, right? So through going through an expert-led process, engaging stakeholders, you're hoping that this is like, you want to take a picture of my beautiful drawing? <laughs> right? You, um, you hope that this is close to this, and then working with a researcher, and like, who knows everything we're not gonna have time to go through, but it's in the slide. You're hoping that your measure actually is good at whatever it is you decide your variable will be to represent this construct. But just know, that this, you know, in social science, it's not like measuring temperature. It's never gonna be that sort of same thing, right? Okay. Um, this is kind of less important. This slide is basically about things you worry about, um, you know, how soon, quickly after, right? Don't wait too long, but then maybe there's a delayed thing. Um, how much data to collect? I think Esther would, you know, potentially, like in the digital world, like you can collect a ton of data. You can give people a 100 question survey. 
but man, like you, you should collect as little data as possible to make your conclusion. You know, cut questions out, cut questions out. Because what happens when you get a hundred question survey? You're like, yeah. You just can't. But you can do things. You, you know, I have been part of survey teams where we needed to ask 200 questions. So then you just you make it fun. You color it in different colors. You you know break it down into sections. You have little introductions. You know, and now in the online survey, you can have people you know clicking through. You don't put 50 questions on the same page. You know, you write really nice letter in the beginning saying, "Look, dude, I know it's hard. Like it's a long survey, you but get an iPad. maybe you get. But that doesn't. No, 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 no." Uh, rewards are nice. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rewards are nice, but it doesn't combat the fact that if you get hundred questions on a page in a font three, uh, replying on your iPad, which makes it even smaller, you're gonna get tired no matter what. So just just trying to like use graphics. Fun examples. Like, yeah. Kind of cool right. Break it up a bit. You know, helps a little bit, but still, you know, you want to do as little as possible to aim to reach your goal. When to collect data, how the transparency issue, like you kind of have to tell people what happens with the data. And again, different companies work differently in terms of transparency, but you know, it always bites you in the back and <laughs> to not be transparent. And like in organization assessments, which are even more vulnerable, you tell people, look, I am asking all these questions. Your manager will never hear your individual response. It's confidential, but will bring, you will hear what everyone thought, you know, like, and you give these people extra motivation to respond. That's right. And then evaluation anxiety, but we talked a little bit about that in the production company example, right? Like, you have to, be experienced enough to know ways to not make it personal and to engage individuals enough to tell them, you know, look, kind of this is for your own good and, and try to get to the bottom of it. Again, I've been in conversations where people walk in and sit down like this and like, you're wasting my time and then I can't kick them out because ultimately, the, one of the reasons we say that evaluation or assessment is an intervention, because what do you think happens when you sit down with someone for an hour and start asking them questions such as, how did it go for you? What did you like? What did you enjoy? Who are you? Like, what happens in this hour? And? You're very in your mind. What else happens? Like when we talk for an hour about you. Oh, enjoy it. You enjoy it. There's a relationship that develops, right? And people, would, people like being part of it. People like being asked about themselves. So even though there's an anxiety, like actually the field is, even though it's anxiety provoking in the beginning, it actually works for you. Because the kind of questions you're asking are often enjoyable to answer. But um, I, so I go through weeks where I fill out three to five surveys in a week mm -hmm. from a Jewish nonprofit organization. And I do it just for the exercise of it to see how long it takes me until I get frustrated. But um, there's, they'll usually send out something that says, just take our quick survey, and then it's 10 questions where you have to supply the answer. So it's not check off. Mm -hmm. It's like, so I wanted to know if you can, if you think that there's a, an ideal mix, either for some percentages or number right. of those kind of qualitative, right. like personal response, anecdote questions um, that you would include in a survey versus some of the more empirical. I think it depends on what your goal is because if you are, um, again, I'm kind of trying to, like in the end of this, for example, if I were to give you a survey and ask you, like how was the, this experience for you? I would probably give you like four, some questions, very simple, um, on this kind of scale. Oh, I'll ask you on which kind of scale. 
like questions like, you know, the lecture was professional, the examples were relevant, I feel like I've gained some knowledge, it was applicable to my organization, that type of thing. And I would give you one open-ended question to say, or maybe two, I mean, for someone like this, maybe one, but if it was like a series of lectures, what was the most helpful, what was the least helpful? And usually that's enough, and it, usually that applies to most organizations. The more open-ended questions you have, the more dropout rate because people just don't have the time. But at the same time, I could see that in some cases, you know, you want uh, actual qualitative, you're forming a program. Like you may want actual qualitative responses because you don't know which way to go. So I, there's not a rule, I don't think. So can I ask you guys a question? So if I were to evaluate this class, and I gave you a check mark, and I was like, how much did you like this? One, I hated it. Two, three, I loved it. It was the best thing ever. Svetlana should be promoted to a god of evaluation. Um, how many points? How many points of response should I give you? So one, two, someone says five. So this is three. Three to five. Three to five. Yeah, ten is like. Okay, so no one thinks like six or four. More than more than three. I think it's I dislike. I like somewhat, or I really like. Okay, so I'm going to challenge you on all the points. Again, there's not a right answer here, but how about four points? Five is good because it seems a, a middle point where it's neither. I think a middle is good, though. Yeah, because sometimes some people are filling up their just kind of like it's like five points and it's like eh, I could have gone either way. Like there needs to be, I think, a don't matter if weight is important. Yeah, but if everyone has like a, a, a more positive or a more negative, no one is 100% neutral. And you want to get this to be reflected because what do you have to do with three out of five? Like, uh, so it's like almost nothing. Uh, I mean, I it's know, good, but not good enough. So you want to say something? No, I, I said also thinking about you made a point more uh, learn to get to use it better, right? Right. On, on yeah. Then, right? Yes. So you want to make it. it you you want to fit it into you want to whatever you you want to connect it to. Right. It, right. So it's all up to it's also the optimal objective. How you want to use it? Yeah. It. So, it, it should, so, so that's the question right. you should ask. So in some cases, you know, maybe it's five, maybe it's three, right. depending so, on how you know, and also what the you know. Right. Exactly. So like on on stuff that has to do with evaluation of courses, or even for a lot of questions, I'm warning you that you're gonna get for this conference that I write. This is gonna be. I'm not gonna let you cop out. I'm gonna force you to tell me if you liked it or not. If you really, really, really liked it, or like liked it okay, or hated it, or like, because I agree, most people like actually have a view, especially after a more like in-depth experience like this, and it's more helpful for me pragmatically to know, right? right? right. A problem is there are some people that are in the middle, but it's not exact science. I have a practical reason to ask a question. I don't give a damn, and I'm not gonna let you cop out in the middle, okay? And that's more also my personality. Like, hell with it, that's what I want. At the same time, in a lot of social science, you do see for statistical reasons, you know, um, fives and threes and seven. Why do 10? You know, you said like, who in their right mind, who can differentiate between nine and 10, like, Really, really, really liked, and like really, 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 really liked. Well, that's Why do ten? Right. That's so. Only when you probably get a high level of satisfaction to see whether people are happy, how you get to do any exception. But ten, like, can you really, as a human, differentiate? You, you. Have I would love European social survey data. Ah, I know. So fun. Details, um, details. Um, so like migration stuff. Yeah, so you 
can do other stuff with it in the analysis. Like you usually don't look at the, at the difference between nine and 10 unless you had like gazillion respondents. But I'll tell you last year when we looked at, we did that design when we asked people in the application process where they were and then asked them after, it's helpful to have a larger scale. You can actually see the difference. Because if you have such crude scale as one to four, it's maybe people change from you know 3.1 to 3.7, and you kind of you losing some of this detail. And if you had one, so I think we had one through six, maybe one through seven, while you know you can't really like have pragmatic implications onto like. You are now 9 out of 10, and in order for you to get to 10 out of 10, you, that's what you have to do. It has more with a research method and trying to identify differences when they're more nuanced. Yeah? Okay. Let me see out of all the slides what is, if there's anything. I'll just orient you to what's, what you have in the pack. So this is more like how you do this, right? So there's steps to typical evaluation. We talked about logic models. Yay! Research questions. We talked a little bit about how you actually put this together, because that's important. You know, this whole concept versus variable versus measurement. Metrics is the surveys you put together. Sampling. The, the actual tools, like the surveys, the focus groups. Oh, I have to show you this. This is a fun example. So we talked about logic models, right? They're inputs, activities, and outcomes. So if you take teddy bears as inputs, what can you make out of teddy bears? I, what do I? You put them through something, through machinery. You can make a chair out of it. And it's an actual teddy bear chair by Fernando Huberta Campana in the Design Museum of London. It's very comfortable, he says. So that's kind of a logic model of the furniture plant and the crazy head of the designer. OK, that's like meant to break up the flow, but I guess five minutes before the end of the session, that's not really appropriate. But I don't know. I was just so proud of what that is. So yeah, this talks about, let me ask you this question. It just often comes up. What's the difference between outputs and outcomes? Get it? What is program, program monitoring versus program evaluation? Only asking you because these questions come up all the time. Right, so monitoring usually has to do with outputs. Have we done like the number of sessions, like, like check mark? Have we housed the number of people we were hoping? How many bricks went into the building? And then evaluation has to do more with what happened to these individuals who were housed, et cetera. Okay, we talked about logic models being a series of if-then relationships. Could be as simple as that black box, you know, person goes in, the theory of change is in the box, the person goes out. Could be more elaborate. This is how more elaborate logic model works. What are the inputs? Then what do we do with people inside? Then how many houses are built as a result? And then short term, medium term, long term outcomes. Right? This is an example of a training session. Because we have all these elements of the model, we have different types of evaluation. So for ROI, I do a number of things. I do 
I don't really do monitoring, right? So output, I don't do. Outcome evaluation, I do. I do a little bit of a process evaluation. I talk to staff and I ask them like how things worked, like in terms of your organization, what could have made it better, right? And they tell me. When you just start a process, if it's a new program, we do something that's called formative evaluation. Formative, as the program is being formed. Kind of like a process evaluation in, in the middle. You like ask, you stop them and say, how's it going for you? Like, what would you do differently now that you're in the middle? When I run my graduate level course, in the middle I ask people, mid-semester evaluation, what's up? What can I change? Cost-benefit analysis, again, there's a slide for you in there. It kind of outlines all those different things. Research questions, finally, to your question. And maybe that's a good way to end this. Um, and that's kind of crucial. That's like the most important thing <laughs> in the whole evaluation. In that a lot of times, you know, when we look at programs, they're different sort of frameworks, but kind of the, um, the two axes that I often use and often start with in evaluating any nonprofit program are level of impact, right, on individual, on an organization, on the group, on the groups of organization, on the community, right? So you kind of like slice it at different levels. But then also look at knowledge impact, the mind, the heart, the attitude, and then the hands or the legs or whatever, the behaviors, right? So this is kind of like actually a famous sort of, I didn't come up with it, knowledge, attitudes, behaviors. Any program you do, it's a great way to start. So when you get your survey, there are gonna be items there like, what do you think you learned in terms of you know, Jewish knowledge, nonprofit knowledge, social entrepreneurial knowledge, leadership, blah, blah, blah. There's gonna be things about attitude. Like what do you think are some of the attitudes that we could be measuring that people could be acquiring, feeling differently as a result of going through ROI? What are some of the attitudes, for example? Yeah, it could be like relationship with Jewish peoplehood and Jewish self. What else? Feeling more positive because they have a network of people that can help them accomplish their goals. Positive, yes. Positive in terms of what? Um, feeling um, about the uh, reality of their Four. project. Correct right, more empowered, more encouraged. I've heard people say, just even because I was selected to come here, like I feel more, like it gives importance to what I do, which I thought was like pretty amazing, right? Great example. How about behaviors? What is differently that you guys potentially may do having gone to ROI as opposed to your colleague who works with you who have not? Like, 
reinforce your building, right? Having all this networking openness to your local. You're stealing my thunder. Yeah, because what I was going to talk about then is there's different levels of impact. So we just talked about you as an individual having gone through ROI. But now you're taking it back to your organization. They're going to have some impact, because you're going to come back all crazy and be like, oh my god, that was amazing. And you're going to inspire your colleagues, right? And you're going to give them some knowledge as well. Hey, I learned about this software. I learned about this technique. I learned this about optimal Twitter timing software. <laughs> uh, you know, And then you're going to also inspire them. So they're going to have some knowledge impact. They're going to have some attitude and impact because you can be all crazy and high from this. And then you actually are going to be able to do something with your policy you have not done before. With, so this is individual organizational. And ultimately with your community, it's going to have some impact as well, right? So like a little F pi, whatever, and then, right? So that's, I think that's a good place to conclude. Like that's, that's a great way to start thinking about impacts or outcomes of any program you're trying to evaluate. Try to look at it from the point of view of knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, which loosely matches to short-term, medium-term, long-term outcomes, but not exactly. But yeah, in the short term you learn something, then your attitude starts to change and behaviors take a little while. But also at the level of um, of different impacts, right? From individual to group to organization. Um, any like last question before we part? And I have uh, more information in here. Happy for you to come up to me and talk specifically during office hours about your organization, what I was going to do here. This is an awesome chart. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, you are so you cool. Can we start asking all sort of awesome questions? Um, I was going to talk to you about this and actually taking you through your organizational example. So if you want to do this in office hours, come up and we can actually try to decompose this and try to come up with a goal for you. So any any last question like that? Sure. Just clarify something. Mm -hmm. You you got program makes an impact on a person. That person that makes an impact on its community. Mm -hmm. That you consider part of like an optimal outcome? Or is there another like yeah. impact that was impacted or right. I mean it doesn't matter what you call it, it depends, but probably, again, I was kind of operating in the ROI yes. kind of universe. So yeah, when you come back, it's probably gonna take you a while to have some impacts on the population you serve, but you can potentially have immediate impacts on the population you serve. So that's why I said it's kind of loosely tied to, because maybe you met someone who gave you a technology that you're gonna be able to implement in a month and that's gonna like skyrocket your effectiveness and productivity. So that's pretty short term. So I, I, wouldn't, I don't wanna theorize here, you know, but you know, some, some behavioral t changes on average generally take longer to take place than emotion or knowledge of specific skills.